we have another Supreme Court decision from the current Supreme Court, which is by any stretch of the imagination, an activist Supreme Court. It's a Supreme Court whose interpretation of freedom of religion is the freedom to impose religion. And it just so happens it's always some form of Christianity or some 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 version of someone's belief about what Christianity is onto others. What is the decision that I'm talking about? The Supreme Court is backing a coach who prays on the field after games. This is a story we talked about when it happened and when it became an issue and when the prayer at the school became an issue. And it has now found its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And we now have a decision. The Associated Press reports the Supreme Court said Monday yesterday, a high school fo- a football coach who knelt and prayed on the field after games was protected by the Constitution, a decision that opponents said would open the door to, quote, much more coercive prayer in public schools. Absolutely. And we will talk about that. The court ruled six to three for the coach with the conservative justices and the majority of the liberals in the dissent. This was the latest in a line of rulings for religious plaintiffs. Listen, when you put a right, it's sometimes we just miss the forest for the trees or we don't see what's right in front of us or whatever metaphor analogy you want to use. We have one of the most right wing Christian Supreme Courts in a long time, and they are ruling for the imposition of Christianity. That's I mean, that that's the bottom line. The case forced the justices to wrestle with how to balance the religious and free speech rights of teachers and coaches with the right of students not to feel pressured into participating in religious practices. The liberal justices in the minority said there was evidence that Bremerton High School coach Joseph Kennedy's prayers at the 50 yard line had a coercive effect on students and allowed him to incorporate his personal religious beliefs into a school event. The, the coach is Christian. After the games, he would lead prayer at the 50 yard line. Now, the liberal justices said there's a coercive aspect to it on students. There's a power dynamic. Of course, dissenting Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote that the decision sets us further down a perilous path in forcing states to entangle themselves with religion. Why states? Well, because this is a public school. It is a state run school and therefore it is in a sense state government. When you look at an image of what the prayer looked like, you can see that this is an establishment of the prayer. This is not I mean, you for people who aren't watching, you've got the coach and a prayer circle of players around him and then media around that taking pictures. You're telling me there's no coercive effect for the the player who would rather be outside of the circle, the one the the two players who say, yeah, I'm opting out of this. You're saying there's no reasonable feeling if you're one of the players that, well, I'm not being forced, but I'm sort of stigmatizing myself. If I say I'm going to opt out of this dog and pony show, of course not. And that's the point that Sonia Sotomayor was making. On the other hand, uh, back to the Associated Press article, the justices in the majority emphasized the coach's prayers came after the games were over. And at a time when he was no longer responsible for students and was free to do other things. Come on, guys. Come on. The stu- so because the game ends now, th- th- there's no more coercive impact. There's no more power dynamic. Well, the game's technically over. So now what the coach is doing with the vast majority of the players has no impact on me. No. The coach and his attorneys at First Liberty Institute, a Christian legal group, were among those cheering the decision. Kennedy said his first reaction was pure joy. Judge Neil Gorsuch, writing for the majority, declared the Constitution and the best of our traditions counsel mutual respect and tolerance, not censorship and suppression for religious and non-religious views alike. But when this is what the coach is establishing, the coach is very clearly setting religious views above non-religious views. So Gorsuch also noted the coach prayed during a period where school employees were free to speak with a friend call for a reservation at a restaurant, check email or attend to other personal matters while students were otherwise occupied. This is yet another. This is the latest completely improper decision from it's a right wing Christian court deciding for right wing Christianity. Now, do any of us believe that if this was the situation, but the coach were Muslim or the coach were a Satanist or whatever the case may be, 
that the entire religious community would see this the exact same way. I mean, would even the very Christians applauding this decision see it the same way? They would say, of course not. They would be saying it's this is pushing Muslim beliefs. This is pushing satanic beliefs on the students. The students are the students. They are at a power disadvantage. This is completely improper. The coach is in a position of authority. The coach controls who gets to play. The coach controls who makes the team the following year. The players will feel pressured to engage in the prayer so as not to anger the coach. It's implicit that the coach decides who makes the cut, who gets to play. And so when the coach says, join me in prayer, but it's just optional. You can go and check email if you want or walk away. The pressure is there. And Sonia Sotomayor is 100 percent correct that it is coercive. All he has to do is say, we're going to pray now. And because of the dynamic, it's the same as if it was in a science classroom. OK, if in a science classroom, the biology teacher says we're going to pray now. Oh, but by the way, I mean, listen, it's just optional. I'm going to pray and most of us are going to pray, but you don't have to. Uh, the power imbalance is the implied pressure. The coaches have more power than the athletes. The teachers have more power than the students. This is the way it is. And unfortunately, this is not going to be the final decision. The last decision that goes this way with this Supreme Court. If you disagree with me, let me know. Um, we have a headline that is scaring many in our audience. One million voters have switched to the Republican Party. Does this spell disaster for the upcoming 2022 midterms? Well, let's think about it. Uh, these are the most important midterms in a long time. Now, if you've been watching the show for a while, you know, I am not hyperbolic with the importance of any particular election. I've said this before in 2012, when Mitt Romney was challenging Barack Obama's reelection, I supported Barack Obama. I didn't support Mitt Romney. I believed Obama was the better choice, but there was no feeling, at least for me, that the future of the country was riding on that. Yeah, I agreed more with Obama than Romney. Romney would have lowered taxes for the rich and would have done other things I don't agree with. And his social views as a conservative Mormon are not my views, but it was not the most important election of our time. Uh, the 2014 midterm, um, it was not the most important election of our time. And I didn't call it that at the time. I can't remember a more important midterm than the 2022 midterm. And so when we now see these headlines, more than one million voters switched to the Republican Party in a warning for Democrats, it is a concerning and disturbing headline. Now, yesterday we talked about on the one hand, it seems as though Democrats actually have some pretty reasonable. Um, uh, uh, oh, they have a reasonable case to make with two issues, the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the um, unwillingness and disinterest from Republicans in acting on gun safety legislation. Re Democrats have some uh, powerful things to run on if voters still care about them in four and a half months. That's good for Democrats. On the other hand, what about this? A political shift is beginning to take hold, writes the Associated Press. Tens of thousands of suburban swing voters who helped fuel the Democratic Party's gains are becoming Republicans. More than a million voters across 43 states have switched to the Republican Party over the last year, according to data analyzed by the AP. The previously unreported number reflects a phenomenon playing out in virtually every region of the country, Democratic and Republican states, along with cities and small towns in the period since Joe Biden replaced Trump. Nowhere is the shift more pronounced and dangerous for Democrats than in the suburbs where well-educated swing voters who turned against Trump's Republican Party in recent years are swinging back, swinging back. Far more people switching to the Republican Party in counties from Denver to Atlanta, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Republicans also gaining ground in medium sized cities such as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Raleigh, North Carolina, Augusta, Georgia and Des Moines, Iowa. Now, what does this mean? Well, on the one hand, we have to understand that the United States is a country plagued by ignorance. The country is plagued by ignorance. So you see very clear differences. Democrats, not nearly liberal or left wing enough for me, but at least connected to reality on fundamental issues of science, of reality, to some degree about economic justice. And it's not a perfect party. Of course, I have so many complaints about the Democratic Party, but at least connected to reality on the Republican side, particularly as Trumpism has has taken over. Uh, there has been this plague of ignorance, which is not only present, it's celebrated. And you'll see some clips later in the show that remind us of this. And uh, it is not a shock in that sense that we are seeing voters to some degree fall for 
Joe Biden did high gas prices. Joe Biden did inflation. Joe Biden is responsible for what's happening in Ukraine or whatever the case may be. And that they would say, well, I guess I'll abandon the Democratic Party and vote for Republicans. It doesn't make any sense when we think about it. It seems completely backwards, but that's not a shock. But there's a couple of caveats with this voter registration shift that I think are, are, are important to keep in mind. One is there are many libertarians that are becoming Republicans. And so there's a difference between a Democrat becoming a Republican and a libertarian becoming a Republican. Libertarians in the United States tend to vote with the Republican Party anyway. The American libertarian movement is pretty right wing. And so if you take this would sort of be like I'm an independent voter. I'm I'm unregistered. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. If I were to announce to you, I am now becoming a Democrat. If a million people like me said I'm now a Democrat, does it really change anything about the outcome of elections? Because I mostly vote for Democrats anyway. I just don't care about the Democratic Party. It's not if I'm going to be a member of something, I want to do that uh, enthusiastically. I have no enthusiasm for the Democratic Party as a party, so I'm just an independent and I vote for Democrats. If a million people like me become Democrats, it doesn't really make a difference. And so of those million, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but a, a bunch of them are libertarians who are mostly right wing and vote for Republicans or don't vote at all becoming Republicans. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the balance is going to shift. The other caveat is that this study about the million voters becoming Republicans, this was before the gun rights discussion that has surfaced after a number of school shootings and mass shootings. And this is before the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And so while we can believe the data, the, the data, this is good data, the, the data is real. There's the libertarian element that I mentioned, which is a caveat. And there's also we don't know yet what the full effect of Roe v. Wade being overturned and the anger about Republican uh, unwillingness to deal with with gun safety. That is not yet part of the polling. So is it a good sign for 22? No, it's not a good sign, but it doesn't have to be the disastrous sign that some are making it out to be. That's my interpretation. Let me know yours. You can find me on Twitter at D Pacman. We're going to take a quick break and be back right after this. We have seen a very interesting turn of events over the last uh, few days. This lawyer, John Eastman, he's the guy who wrote the memo to Donald Trump saying, here's how Mike Pence could overturn the election. There is a question as to whether Eastman really believed that that was a viable way to overturn the election or knew it would be against the law. And this has become a very central issue in the January 6th committee. Eastman has now appeared on Tucker Carlson saying that the FBI seized his phone last week. There is video of the FBI seizing his phone last week. And to many of us, this doesn't come as a surprise because supposedly this other attorney, Hirschman testified. Oh, the, the other attorney, Eric Hirschman, testified that he told Eastman, you need a criminal defense attorney for what you've done here. So we're go going to go through all of it. But for starters, here is Tucker Carlson, very, very angry, showing the video of Eastman having his phone seized by the FBI. Now, critically and illegally, they seized his phone before they presented him with a warrant, and it's on tape. Watch. Sir, go ahead and put your arms off for me. Can I see the warrant? Sir, put your arms off for me. Can I see the warrant, please? I'd like to see the warrant. I'd like to see the warrant. I'd like to see the warrant. Can you see the warrant, I'd like to see the warrant before you take my property. Sir, here comes the warrant right now, sir. I want you to see that they took my property before providing me with the warrant. I'd like to read the warrant. OK, now I have to tell you, I am as for due process as anyone else. If they didn't have a warrant, I would be saying this is an absolute travesty of justice. I spoke to a couple of criminal defense attorneys and they said, you know, this is really sort of a technicality. The concern is the reason you grab the phone and then show the warrant is he could smash the phone. OK, if you say here, you don't. Here's the warrant. Take your time to read it in a second. He grabs the phone, throws it on the ground and crushes it and destroys evidence. Now, would that be a crime? Yes. But if the evidence is gone, the evidence is gone. So criminal defense attorney attorneys told me. This is not we just show up and steal a phone. Uh, if law enforcement shows up and steals a phone. They have the warrant. They wanted to secure the phone. They show the warrant and the warrant, of course, was for the phone. And that's it. So 
in spe I'm not a lawyer in speaking to lawyers. They said this is this is not the travesty of justice that Tucker Carlson is making it out to be. So then Tucker Carlson invites Eastman and Eastman says that by seizing the phone, it's also a crime because he has privileged communications with clients on the phone. This warrant is invalid on its face. Um, but more importantly, and I, and I think this is extremely important, the, the authority to seize all of my information in modern modern smartphones, that's access to all my private financial records. I'm an attorney. It's access to all my privileged communications with nearly 100 different clients that I have currently. All, this stuff, this stuff uh, is what we used to call a general warrant that the British king issued to just go rummage through somebody's belongings to see if they could find evidence of some crime. The very reason we have the Fourth Amendment is to prevent that kind of abuse. It's very weird because he's a lawyer, but he seems to misunderstand so many things. His argument, it almost sounds like you can never seize the phone of a lawyer. Lawyers use phones to communicate with clients. If you can never seize a phone, if it has client communications, it's almost like you can never investigate a lawyer. I mean, this this is the way investigations work. And, and of course, the handling of the privileged uh, information is a different matter. But is is this guy really this dumb? Now, any of us who have been paying attention to this would have anticipated that this would have happened. Here is attorney Eric Hirschman, who for the January 6th committee described speaking to John Eastman and saying what you need to do is get yourself a criminal defense attorney for what you're doing. Eastman, I don't remember why he called me He's in a, or he texted me or called me, wanted to talk with me, and he said he couldn't reach others. And he started to ask me about something dealing with Georgia and preserving something potentially for appeal. Uh, and I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I said, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth for now on. Orderly transition. And then he screamed and said, I don't want to hear any other effing words coming out of your mouth no matter what other than orderly transition, repeat those words to me. And I screamed at him and said, eventually he said, orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. Right. So we all, of course, have been expecting this to happen. And indeed, now it did. Now, here's the cherry on top. Tucker Carlson, you know, just lionizing this guy who came up with an illegal way to try to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. Tucker says, if you're not a Biden voter, you should regularly be purging your phone of all of your text messages and emails because they could be coming for you. The very reason we have the Fourth Amendment is to prevent that kind of abuse. And yet that's what they're doing here. And it's just another reminder to anyone who didn't vote for Joe Biden to erase your texts and emails every single day. And that is a sincere piece of advice. I hope everyone follows. But they haven't charged you with a crime. They've given you no evidence that they're going to charge you with a crime, but they treat you like a drug kingpin or a rapist and seize your phone. It can, <laughs> is this legal? Well, and I don't think so. And yeah. uh, they uh, <laughs> it's. A it, it appears that it is actually legal. So there's Tucker Carlson recommending clear your phone of all texts and emails every day if you didn't vote for Joe Biden. These people live in a fantasy world, but it is a dangerous fantasy world where their delusions have real world impact. We expected at some point Eastman was going to be under fire legally, and it appears that he now is. We will follow it. I want to follow up on yesterday's discussion about will they imprison women who seek abortions? And will they imprison or attempt to imprison doctors who perform abortions? Abortion has become a criminal act in the state of South Dakota. Uh, South Dakota, uh, the governor of South Dakota is Christy Nome. Christy Nome is a big Trump tool, a big Trump suck up brown noser. And uh, I want to focus in on this question of going after abortion doctors. She did a number of interviews on Sunday, pieces of which we looked at yesterday. But I want to focus in on this issue of imprisoning doctors now. In multiple interviews, Christy Nome went out of her way to say, 
we're not going to prosecute women when it comes to abortion, although she left the possibility open if women went to a different state where abortion is legal and then come back to South Dakota. That was a little scary yesterday, but she is making clear there seems to be a significant appetite in South Dakota to go after legally the doctors performing abortions. Let's take a look at this first clip from Face the Nation on Sunday. America has the worst maternal mortality rate of any developed country. What specifically are you doing for these women who not just when they have the baby, but during their pregnancy? Are you giving them paid leave? Are you giving them more health care rights in your state? Are you giving them more state funding? What exactly are you doing to keep them alive during their pregnancy? Hmm. You know, I think that will be a lot of the debate that will go on now in every different state. Now that the Supreme Court has made this decision, the power. But she's not asking about the debate. She's asking, what are you doing in South Dakota? Or to make these decisions really goes to each individual state. We've already talked about that in South Dakota. Uh, what's the state's role in this and what can we do to help these individuals that are in these situations, get them the health care that they need to to help their baby be born healthy and help them be parents or help them choose a loving family to raise that. Child. So a non answer. OK, so you're still so, figuring out the specifics. Uh, OK, well, and, you know, this trigger law was put into place years ago uh, and it was to go into a into law as soon as the Supreme Court made a decision such as it did. So okay. that's the debate and discussion that we're having. But I think what's incredible and what's going on is that the people will decide, you know, yeah. elected officials at the state level is who they'll be talking to to decide what their state's laws look like. South Dakota's. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, under our past several years and have stood for life and defending life. And yeah. I think we'll continue to have those debates on how we can support these mothers and what it means to really make sure that we're not prosecuting mothers ever in a situation like this when it comes to abortion, that it will always be focused towards those doctors who knowingly break the law to perform abortions in our state. The criminal uh, charges will be focused on the doctors, the doctors. Um, she then appeared on this week. And again, she said if doctors knowingly break the law, they should indeed be prosecuted. Let's take a look. And what about medication abortions, the, the so-called abortion pill? How will you know if women receive those in the mail and should those women be prosecuted? I don't believe women should ever be prosecuted. I don't believe that, that mothers in this situation should ever be prosecuted. Now, doctors who knowingly violate the law, they should be prosecuted, definitely. And we the pill is OK. You're saying the pill's OK. Again, Martha, you're interrupting, but I, I am answering your question. I don't believe that the telemedicine abortions are safe for individuals, for women to conduct at home. Many times they're doing it unsupervised. It's a medical procedure. And so I do believe that there should be a physician supervision in place when that is being conducted by any individual. All right. So they're going to go after the doctors and they do seem to sort of be cohering around this talking point. Remember that early in Trumpism, they weren't totally clear on do you punish the women because there was this time Trump was asked about do you punish the women and Trump said yes. Do you believe in punishment for abortion? Yes or no is a principle. Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment for the woman. Yeah, there has to be some form. Ten no, cents, ten years. I don't what? know. There you go. And of course, afterwards, Trump was told, no, 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 that's the wrong talking point. We don't say that. We say punish the doctors. And by the next day, Trump was saying, no, 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 I didn't mean I didn't mean punish the women. I didn't mean that. I mean, punish the doctors. Now, um, two states so far, Minnesota and Massachusetts, have seen their governors sign orders protecting providers who perform abortions for out of state residents. And that's one aspect of this. Uh, the governors of Minnesota and Massachusetts have implemented legal protections for reproductive health care providers who serve out of states, out of state residents who come to their state seeking such care. Uh, that's one aspect of this. But this is sort of a different question, which is what about circumstances where you have in state? Everything is in state. What is it that is going to be the goal of these extreme right wing states? So this is increasingly looking very much like, you know, a Margaret Margaret Atwood book. Quite frankly, that's what it is looking like. And uh, it is scary stuff that we are going to continue tracking, but it is not looking particularly good. Hey, this is wild. Uh, this crazy Trumpist Republican candidate, Carrie Lake, she lost it when Fox News's Brett Baer confronted her about her hypocrisy on drag queens. Now, in case you don't know about drag queens, drag queens are typically we're talking about male performers 
who use what's called drag clothing and makeup to imitate and sometimes even exaggerate female gender signifiers. But it's entertainment purposes. Drag queens are not trans people. You might have trans drag queens, but when we talk about drag queens, we're talking about sort of like a performance uh, thing. We're not talking about um, uh, transgender people. OK, fine. So Carrie Lake has been uh, viciously going after drag queens and people who enjoy drag queens and all these different things. And it turns out that uh, a drag queen came out and said, I've performed for Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake has hired drag queens to perform multiple times. She's a hypocrite. OK, so she goes on Fox News. Brett Bayer confronts her. She didn't expect to be confronted about this on Fox News, and she flips out. It says Arizona GOP candidate who criticized drag queens was once a fan, according to a drag queen. This <laughs> is the quote Arizona GOP gubernatorial. By the way, it's obviously so stupid what's going on, but she is a hypocrite and good for Brett Bayer for asking her about it. And a Carrie Lake, who has attacked drag queens as dangerous to children, attended the shows of drag queen Richard Stevens for more than 20 years and once hired him to perform at her home. Do you <laughs> care to address that? I do care. I actually do care to address that, and I'm really shocked. I'm actually appalled Ooh. that Fox News would take defamatory story like that. And we are pursuing legal action against this drag queen. Sue the drag queen. I'm appalled that you would bring that up when you have not talked about our stolen election. You failed we to talk about We just spent three that. questions, Ms. Lake, talking about this. I just you asked haven't. you a number of questions about it. I played the Arizona this House Speaker. This is the first of it. Let's address, this, let's address this story that's in the Washington Post. Every candidate takes wow. tough stories. I'm asking you to I'm, respond I'm to it to if you'd like it. to. I'm happy to address it, but I, I'm really disappointed in Fox. I thought you were a little better than CNN. I'm really disappointed. <laughs> this is a person who I covered for decades for decades 20 years and he's never been in my home he says he's been in my home for a drag show that's ludicrous he's never been in my home he's lied we tried to serve him defamation papers okay and he's so shady that we can't even track him down because he's not even <laughs> welcome at the places well, what that he works i'm sorry but this is the last question i'm going to ask what about these pictures of you with him <laughs> isn't that the best what about the pictures where you're together? Richard Stevens. Brent, and the what about the, is, the post? I've performed for Carrie's birthday. I've performed in her home. That's not I've true. I've performed for her at the, some of true. the seediest bars in Phoenix. I don't want to ask these questions. I ask you to address them. I, That's actually, it. Actually, I, I think you do want to ask them, but you don't want to ask about 2,000 Mules. Right. I the think Dinesh you, D'Souza film, too. That's the real issue, guys. I do want to ask about this. This is absolutely ludicrous. I'm, I'm talking about drag shows in schools. This is what triggered this man. Somebody who goes to a drag show with female impersonators is one thing. We don't want our tax money going into drag shows at school. Okay, I understand and what you're making a difference the there, but you're I'm saying his allegations yeah. are wrong, is They're what you're false. saying. Yes, okay. I am. Right. And I'm Despite the pictures, the allegations are completely untrue. Unhinged, unhinged, and this is what it has come down to, folks. These people are out of their minds and they might win in November. If we don't get out and vote, we'll have these clips on our Instagram. Find us on Instagram at David Pakman show. It is great to have back on the program Bobby Azarian, who's a cognitive neuroscientist blogger for psychology today and whose new book is The Romance of Reality, How the Universe Organizes Itself to Create Life, Consciousness and Cosmic Complexity. Bobby, great to speaking to you again. Thanks for having me back, David. So, I mean, the book is fascinating because it starts with these are just big topics, right? How what what are the origins of life? What is what is consciousness? What is sort of our place? How do we understand our ability to perceive and understand? But it also has very much real world kind of day to day nitty gritty implications about how we solve individual problems, political questions, how people relate to each other, how we understand what is real and what is not real and, and kind of epistemology. Can you talk just like generally what what was the main point you wanted to get across in the book? So, yeah, there are a lot of points that you mentioned, uh, but the general idea is that uh, so it's it, I guess to contrast it to the old paradigm, the old paradigm, uh, the kind of reigning scientific worldview was known as the reductionist paradigm. And it basically says that life is uh, something of a cosmic accident and that life is uh, transient and has no larger cosmic significance. 
Uh, but the story that's emerging from complexity science is challenging that. Uh, it basically says that the universe isn't getting increasingly disordered as once thought. It's getting more and more complex. And life is a part of that uh, complexification process. And once life emerges, it becomes the driver of that process. So uh, we're not an accident. We are a natural manifestation of the laws of physics and the evolutionary dynamics that emerge from those laws. And this means that life has something like a purpose in the universe. And that's to see that life continues to persist and spread throughout the cosmos. So what's fascinating about that to put to pause there is sure. if people listen to 90 percent, but not 100 percent of what you're saying, they might misunderstand what you're saying as meaning either one, that there is purpose in the way that some attribute to religion or God, which is not what you're saying here. You're saying that the purpose of life is, is to persist. Life wants to continue, so, so to speak. And number two, if people listen to 90 percent, but not 100 percent of what you're saying, they might think you're saying that the pre-existing ideas, for example, about entropy are being contradicted by what you're saying. But you're not really you're 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 sort of expanding on that uh, in, in a sense, if I understand correctly. Yeah. So to address those two points, uh, let's start with the entropy point first. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about what the second law of thermodynamics means. Yes. And uh, there's a statistical interpretation of that law that basically says that ordered systems will naturally move uh, toward a more disordered state. And uh, that that's true for closed systems. So closed systems are systems that aren't open to energy coming in from an outside source. So the planet Earth is an open system. And that is because we have a star. We have our sun that is radiating all this energy down on the planet. And uh, those energy flows uh, basically uh, organize life. And uh, we so energy flowing through a simple chemical system will organize it. And that is the mechanism that creates life uh, on a planet. So the idea. Um, basically is that life can continue to persist against this tendency towards disorder as long as it can continue to extract energy from the environment because the energy is used to sustain itself. But uh, in using that energy, uh, it uses up ordered energy and it dissipates that energy as heat and that creates entropy too. So complexity can grow and grow and grow if life can spread and find more energy. And the second law of thermodynamics really just says that there's an energetic cost to creating order, that you have to use some of this uh, available energy and uh, basically turn that energy into entropy. So it doesn't violate the second law unless you think the second law applies to the whole universe and says that the universe is growing increasingly disordered. Uh, this challenges that and says we need to uh, understand that entropy is this complex term. It takes on uh, a number of forms and that life uh, doesn't have to be transient. If we can solve our problems uh, and continue to extract energy, um, then uh, we can persist. The religious purpose that is often debated by Christian apologists and others you're talking about purpose in a different way. And, and it makes intuitive sense. If you think about, for example, um, uh, evolution, right? And the idea, mm. well, well, when we when we talk about purpose, you could say the purpose here is evolution is fueling more fit species so that they can continue to live so that life persists, as you're talking about. We don't have to talk about purpose ideologically necessarily or as a designed thing and still acknowledge that maybe purpose could be an appropriate word in terms of life wanting to preserve and continue. Yes. So uh, there was a big movement to kind of get purpose out of biology in the 20th century. Right. But we're understanding that uh, purpose or agency uh, is really the defining characteristic of life. So if you compare life to an inanimate object, like a rock or a chair, those things don't do anything interesting. And if they move, if a rock um, you know, tumbles down a hill, it's because of the force of gravity. Or uh, if you see a rock moving 
on the street. It's being pushed by a gust of wind. But life uh, moves uh, according to survival goals. So it has agency. And this agency is basically a product of the information stored in living systems, which are adaptive systems. So uh, it's really helpful to talk about purpose. But if you zoom out and you look at the universe and you understand that life uh, isn't any sort of uh, magical, uh, it doesn't have some sort of magical ingredient propelling it, then you see that uh, the inanimate matter in the universe is waking up uh, in the form of life. And so you don't see it so much as just life trying to persist. You see it as the universe sort of waking up uh, through life and being able to experience itself. So there are some big, uh, what I would call spiritual implications of this theory, uh, but it is an entirely mechanistic, naturalistic picture because we can understand these uh, processes that generate complexity uh, we can formalize them with mathematics. So um, there's no magic in this framework. However, I will say it is still really mysterious why the universe is so fine-tuned mm. uh, to give rise to life. And if you uh, believe the argument in this book, uh, it, it doesn't just allow life. It necessitates life and basically ensures that life will continue to adapt and spread. So now in, in uh, along those lines, yeah. when we look at societies and the way that human society is organized, we can find lots of relatively persistent. You know, I'm talking here about hundreds of years, which is still a rel relatively small amount of time. But but it, it's modern society. We see lots of mechanisms that seem like they would run counter to that. Right. Uh, world wars, for example, um, the seeking and obtaining of nuclear weapons, which, you know, it's hard to argue that nuclear weapons in some long term way will preserve life. They seem only only able to potentially destroy it or at best do do nothing at all. Conflict, etc. Um, we what is the role at the sort of more medium term society level of some of these systems that seem to run very contrary to 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 life? So there's a principle in the book uh, that I call uh, Popper's principle, named after the philosopher of science, Karl Popper. And it basically says that problems create progress. Mm. So you mentioned World War II, and it was a terrible time. Uh, a lot of bad things happened, but that same time period produced the computer and information technology. And the computer was kind of a need uh, to do a couple of things. Uh, people have seen the movie about Alan Turing, where the computer was used to crack uh, Enigma, the Nazi code. Yep. And uh, the computer was also used to try to create uh, uh, nuclear weapons um, by von Neumann and others. Uh, so you do get this kind of paradoxical thing where you have technology that has uh, terrible uses and really good uses. Uh, so it does seem um, a little bit contradictory, but not when you realize that it's the problems that uh, we face um, that pushes us to find solutions and pushes mm. us in the direction of progress. Uh, mass extinctions, uh, basically, if you look at the, the, the trend, uh, as far as like biological complexity and diversity, after every mass extinction, uh, the biosphere went to new levels of complexity and diversity. So it's like uh, life adapts and evolve and evolves uh, because it has challenges. So uh, this will lead people to kind of question this uh, idea of progress because they you know see all these things going on, these mounting existential challenges like climate change and the threat of nuclear war, rising income inequality. Uh, but it is precisely those challenges that uh, push us to uh, find solutions that ultimately lead to progress. Now, that doesn't mean we ignore the like. So, for example, someone might hear that and say, hey, listen, based on what Bobby said, we just shouldn't worry about climate change because no matter even if it is as destructive as the worst hypotheses say it is, eventually life will persist and things will just kind of like reorder themselves and everything will be OK. But it sounds like what you're saying is these are opportunities for humans to do things and to figure out solutions. 
Yes. So that thing that you said earlier would be like the the the, the worst way to interpret this. Yes. Uh, we can't. It, the process doesn't happen on its own, and it goes back to uh, the point that we're part of this process. Yes. So we need to try uh, our very best to overcome these solutions. If not, we will be the errors that get corrected by natural selection and the people who come after us or the, uh, you know, species or civilization that comes after us uh, will uh, do something different. Uh, hopefully they'll learn from our mistakes. But yeah, it's this process of continually learning from failure. Right. And uh, yeah, we, we have to do everything in our power to overcome these existential challenges. And uh, one thing that this uh, theory uh, kind of um, shows about society is that societies work in a very similar way uh, as organisms, organisms, biological organisms. So you are an organism and you usually think about that as being one single thing, but you're a collective of cells right. that are working together in an integrated fashion. Your brain is a collection of 80 billion neurons, all connected by 10,000 connections each. Uh, and the output of that collective computation is your intelligent behavior and your productivity. So you can look at a society as being a social organism, and you can even look at uh, the network of humans that spans the planet as forming something like a global brain uh, because of the internet and social media and now blockchain systems uh, connecting us in a very similar way. Uh, and if we want to overcome our existential challenges, we have to use the full computational power of the global brain. And this gives us some principles for how to optimize our social, political and economic systems. So on that note, in the limited time we have left all of this, if we go down to kind of like the nitty gritty level, what are the immediate things that in human society could be done as you see it to better orient ourselves towards this future? And this could be do, uh, regulating social media, passing some laws about carbon. I mean, really, like if we just were to say what what are the bullet points of things that could be done by governments and organizations at this point to better serve our future? Is there a sort of short list? Uh, yes, uh, there's a long list and a short list. So everything that, you know, people are like fighting for right now, those are, are you know, worthy things that uh, we should be tackling. But uh, there are some uh, more basic principles that come from complexity science, which just tells us uh, how to get the maximum amount of computational power out of a system. So uh, computational power is a function of how complex a system is. A system is more complex if there are more components and there are more connections between those components. Hmm. And you also want a variety of different types of components. So. Uh, we want to be connected in, you know, a way similar to how uh, neurons are connected in the brain. So uh, any nation that uh, cuts their people off from the Internet is stopping that free flow of information. Mm. And the free, the free flow of information allows for greater social awareness and knowledge exchange. So, you know, countries like North Korea, Russia, China that are doing that, that's not intrinsically good for a complex adaptive system in the long run. Uh, the other thing I mentioned was uh, the need for diversity among components. So the human body uh, has over 200 cell types because they're doing a division of labor. A society of all doctors or society of all engineers or musicians uh, wouldn't do well. So we need a specialization because it allows for a division of labor hmm. and uh, we so we need diversity and uh, not just cultural diversity, but a diversity of ideas. Um, so uh, any system, any nation that doesn't allow for criticism of the current system, that's also intrinsically bad because you want new ideas that challenge the status quo. Uh, that's sort of how uh, progress happens, too. Um, the last thing that I would say is uh, income inequality. Mm. So we're seeing uh, levels of income inequality uh, higher than we've ever seen before. And that means all of the resources are concentrated in these small pockets. So that would be so if society is a social organism, that would be like all of the resources, like the blood, the nutrients, all 
um, in certain areas and not systemically flowing right. uh, to all of the appendages. And if that is the case, then uh, ultimately that superorganism will die because those parts will fester and then affect uh, the rest of the body. So we want to uh, have a way to kind of redistribute these resources. I don't think like a communist model or like a socialist model is necessarily the best way to do that because um, you don't want like a government with all this power like calling the shots. You want some sort of uh, natural uh, way to do that. And um, I think the decentralization movement made popular by cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin uh, is a way to do that because uh, NFTs will allow uh, for a new crowdfunding mechanism that will allow you know normal people to raise money for a business project. And then the people who are uh, donating to that project, like they would Kickstarter, they actually become investors. Right. Um, so there's a lot of creative ways, you know, in, in to, to think about how to structure society. Maybe we need some optimal balance between socialist and capitalist policies. Uh, decentralization could provide, you know, new ideas about how to find that balance. Uh, but yeah, we need to look at how nature has optimized systems through evolutionary processes uh, to kind of uh, teach us how to best optimize society. We've been speaking with cognitive neuroscientist and blogger Bobby Azarian. The new book is The Romance of Reality, How the Universe Organizes Itself to Create Life, Consciousness and Cosmic Complexity. Bobby, always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much, David, and congratulations on being a new father. Thank you. Radical Trumpist Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert or Bobear, for those who prefer that pronunciation. Our friend Ro Khanna, for example, prefers Bobear, which I kind of I kind of like it as a satirical ring to it. Um, I uh, she has gone full theocracy. She is saying she's tired of this separation of church and state junk. She doesn't like it. Now, this is Christian dominionism. This is radical Christianity. This is a full full fledged Christian nationalism. And that is exactly what Congresswoman Boebert is proposing. She spoke, you know, as usual at some kind of crazy event in Colorado. I guess who even cares? It's these wild events. And um, listen to what she had to say about separation of church and state. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. Ooh. The church is supposed to direct the government. What? The government is wait a not second. Which church? There's like a thousand. It's supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. That's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Ooh. Now, which church is supposed to direct the government? Because there are major differences between, say, Baptists and Pentecostals and born again Christians or evangelicals or Catholics or whatever. Ne never mind. Right. Like Jews, Muslims, atheists. OK, um, this is full fledged Christian nationalism. It's dystopian and it's dangerous. And most importantly, it's not true. All of the framers of the American Constitution understood that no establishment meant no national church, no government involvement in religion, period. That's it. And they now want to try for people who say that we should go by the letter of what the founders said. They sure want to do a bunch of reinterpretation now, as usual, to just fit whatever outcome they want today. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison believed that unless you completely separate religion and the state, you don't really have religious freedom. It doesn't matter whether the founders themselves were theists or deists or Christian or whatever the case may be. And often people like Lauren Boebert and others will say these were religious individuals. And so when they talked about all of these things, you have to sort of read between the lines that they mean like this is a Christian country. No, 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 no. They understood even for their own religious freedom or that of anybody else's. There is not really religious freedom unless you separate church and state. And that means freedom uh, uh, from and of religion. 
and she's complaining about overreaching regulations. How is it that people who are worried about being told you have to separate church and state are on the other hand, OK, with the government telling people how to make their own medical decisions? How can that be? How can you simultaneously say there's too much government overreach in trying to separate church and state and just let everybody do whatever they want privately and leave religion out of government? OK, that's too oppressive. But the government can come in and say, oh, abortion. No, no, we're going to decide what medical procedures or lack thereof are best for you. And we're saying you can't go and get it. Uh, there's a huge disconnect somewhere between their ears. And I think it's because it's chocolate pudding that is between their ears. That seems to be what's going on. And uh, flippantly, this church and state, it's sort of like if someone were to say, I'm so sick of this due process stuff. Just throw them in jail. I'm mean, just due process, um, Miranda, a speedy trial. Get, guys, just throw them in prison. That's the equivalent of what she's saying. I'm so tired of the separation of church and state junk. Everybody talking about this exhausting freedom of speech. Just shut them up. Wait, wait, but hold on. It's part of the framework on which this country, I'm so tired of it. Just throw it out. Dystopian. And this is what the country would become if people like Lauren Boebert end up being in charge. All right. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. Many of you emailed me about it. This is really funny. Newsmax host Greg Kelly is calling out Rudy Giuliani and saying, dude, you're claiming you got attacked. It seems like you're exaggerating. So if you haven't followed this story, let me back it up for you. Rudy Giuliani was at I guess it was like a shop, right? And someone came up to Rudy and kind of patted him on the back and I guess said something negative to him. OK, they patted him on the back and Rudy just turned around and looked at them before the video was out. Rudy was claiming that he was hit. It felt like a boulder that it knocked him multiple steps forward. He thought it was I mean, it, that it was just like this crazy, vicious physical attack. Then the video came out and it becomes very clear that it was not some guy patted Rudy on the back and said something negative. OK. Rudy has doubled down and he keeps talking about this assault. And this is so funny. Even cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right wing Newsmax and its host, Greg Kelly, says, I got to be honest, Rudy, it really doesn't look that bad. So if you're watching, you'll actually see the video of the I think they play the video of the su supposed assault. Check this out. To do it. I didn't know he was this good. I really didn't. And his uh, his grasp of the issue. By the way, Rudy's audio plagued by background noise. Particularly the issue of crime and the economy is remarkable. And the main thing that he has is passion, tremendous passion. Hey, Mr. Mayor, is somebody mowing the lawn right outside your window? I can barely hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're at a big rally. We're at a big rally in Staten Island right around the corner from where I was attacked yesterday. <laughs> we have that, actually. You were at, a, I guess, a oh, delicatessen of some kind. I'm going to show the people what happened. And you tell me, because let me see the video, if you don't mind. Uh, this person with the hand on your back, I got to be honest, it doesn't look that bad, but <laughs> I, I understand that looks uh, can be uh, deceiving. Uh, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was the woman who was rubbing my back, not the guy who hit me. You're watching. So the woman, that woman, uh, gave a statement to the police that the guy hit me so hard that she herself almost fell. Yeah, so, it's very clear that didn't happen from the video. The reverberation of it. She's a city worker. The entire building echoed from when Rudy was patted on the back. It reverberated. They were worried it was going to break glass. There's a second grade detective. That that's that's the lady who uh, helped me. Oh, all right, Mrs. good. Now that makes sense. Uh, yeah, um, guys, when Greg Kelly from Newsmax is saying, you know, it really doesn't seem that bad, you might have gone a little bit too far, saying that it reverberated throughout. The, it reverberated throughout the building. Can you imagine? So okay, so that's the Rudy thing. I don't really want to talk about it too much more, but uh, and of course, if if some if someone doesn't want to be touched, they shouldn't be touched. That's absolutely the case. Okay, so I'm not defending. But it was like a boulder. It knocked me forward multiple steps. The guy patted Rudy and Rudy turned to his left. That's all that happened. OK, so Greg Kelly is not buying it. 
We have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. Here is a really great question about the recent medical drama uh, that I talked about yesterday, including uh, the C-section birth of my daughter and the rehospitalization of my girlfriend for a perforated uh, du- duodenum duodenum. People were emailing me saying, sir, you're pronouncing it incorrectly. Nuclear proliferation. Yeah, I'm doing my best with pronunciations. Anyway, here's an interesting question about the entire thing. Hey, David, I'm glad your girlfriend is all right, but I have have a question. I don't know what type of health insurance you guys have because you run an independent business. Correct. But how much did all this cost? How much were you billed for? Um, The last time I went to the hospital, they charged me $10,000. To go five minutes down the street. Yep. Fortunately, though, I was on Medicaid at the time, so I didn't have to pay for any of it. This is a great question. My, I, we have not gotten any bills yet. OK, I do plan to open up the books like I did after my appendectomy. You might remember my appendectomy it was about 40 grand of which I had to pay my two thousand dollar deductible. OK, so um, indeed, both both of us are self-employed. And so we buy insurance from our state's marketplace when back during my appendectomy, when I was in Massachusetts, I bought I had a plan I purchased through what's called the Mass Health Connector. New York State has a similar thing through which we now have our plans called my state of health. These are not the best plans. Okay, so my expectation is that uh, we are going to owe the two thousand dollar deductible for the birth and that associated hospital stay, the two thousand dollar deductible for the rehospitalization for the surgery. And then because of the ambulance call, I think that we probably have like a man. I don't know. It's probably a five hundred dollar copay for the ambulance ride like these plant. These are not cheap plans and they also cover very little. So that's what I expect to owe. I think our we're going to owe somewhere between four and five thousand dollars for all of this. I think the build amounts could could probably get to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. My understanding is that C-section birth and subsequent hospitalization can be 80 grand or so. And then um, the surgery plus like a six day hospitalization after that in I think it's considered subacute care. I don't really know. That could be another that could be a hundred grand, one twenty. I think that the 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 sort of sticker price on everything is going to be somewhere around two hundred thousand, could even be a little bit higher, we will see. And I expect we will owe somewhere around four or five thousand. So I'll open the books when we get the bills. I haven't gotten them yet. I'll keep everybody posted. We've got a great bonus show for you today. Uh, with some horrible stories, by the way. One positive thing is Elizabeth Warren says Democrats are only two votes away from codifying Roe v. Wade. Is it too late? Well, we'll talk about it. Stacks of bodies have been found dead in a trailer on the U.S. Mexico border. Horrifying story. And a study finds that cannabis users are 25 percent more likely to need emergency care or hospitalization. But the question is, is it because of their cannabis use or is it that people more likely to need emergency care and hospitalization are more likely to use cannabis, which would be a very, very different explanation. All of those stories and more on today's bonus show, Oh, the bonus show where you want to make money. But everybody else that makes money to fund themselves is bad. Well, I invite you to sign up at joinpacman.com. Get instant access to the David Pakman show bonus show. Thank your lucky stars every day. You're not Dave Pakman. Well, it's not that bad, Alex. Thank you very much. Coupon code big voting 22. Sign up at joinpacman.com. I will see you on the bonus show.